Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to our new webcast series, Instant Insight, brought to you by Arrow SI's Learning Services. To kick off this new series, David Lover will be speaking today about Avaya Aura 7.0 and explain what's new that you should know from the Arrow SI perspective. Just a few notes as we go through the presentation, all lines are now on mute. If you have any questions, you have the option to type a question in the chat box. And if we will try to get to as many questions as possible. With that said, Dave, I will hand the line over to you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so yeah, this is Dave Lover, uh, Vice President of Strategy and Technology for your wonderful favorite business partner and reseller and systems integrator, Aero Systems Integration. Um, Today we've got a really cool topic, I think. Um, Arrow, uh, it's it's all about Avaya Aura, and I think most people know that there's a new version out. Um, it actually came out back in August of 2015, but uh, even Avaya's kind of been keeping it low key. Um, I'm certainly not keeping it low key. I'm a big fan of this release and, uh, and 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 what it has to offer. So I thought this would be a good way to kick off this series. Um, is you know kind of what's new with uh, some of the hot stuff within the, the world of Avaya. So um, when we think of Avaya Aura 7, um, there's a number of different changes, and there's certainly some maintenance changes and and you know with upgrade advantage and, and the upgrade protection side of this. And I'm really not focusing on that part of that uh, for this this call. For for our purposes today, I'm going to kind of stick with the product, the platform, um, and maybe give you some of the golden nuggets that you might want. Uh, you know, as you decide, hey, is really seven uh, for me or not? Um, you know, obviously six, release six was a really big, awesome release, and uh, it kind of shows by how long <laughs> release six has been available. I think we're we're into five years now, roughly, that release six has been around. Um, so you certainly got some good value out of that, and um, you know, as as they not only really enforce the aura concept, but all of the other things that go along with it. So, um, you know, some of the big high-level things that we'll talk about today is, you know, if you think of what are your nuggets that you're looking at in terms of how do you um, how do you justify whether you go to seven? You know, I usually think of people trying to save money um, in terms of you know overall to total cost of ownership of what can I do? Are things easier than they've been in the past? You know, saving you at admin time um, or just the the infrastructure as a whole? What kind of cool things can we do with that? There's also things of um, the scalability, you know, which is always increasing, always, always, always. Every release, everything seems to grow more, um, and so we'll talk. About about some of those things, but you know, big one: 250,000 SIP users, um, and interestingly, 350,000 SIP devices. Really highlighting the fact that um, in today's modern system, the focus is on the user. It's not on the device. It's not on the extension like it used to be. It's it, you're a human being first, and oh by the way, all of us as human beings have multiple devices. So you find yourself very quickly realizing and seeing that people, individual users, have multiple devices and the need for you know the support of that. Um, so 250,000 users, 350,000 SIP devices, uh, you know, 28 session managers in a single enterprise network. That's huge. Um, definitely interesting and good stuff. Security. Um, there's some it's some things that are certainly cool, like the TLS secured gateway links, and that has pluses and minuses to it. I think as we start using TLS as the encryption mechanism, which is absolutely kind of the, a big going forward standard in, in the industry as a whole, um, it also presents some new d things you have to deal with. Um, you know, when you start looking at TLS, that's all about security certificates and how you manage those. Um, and so, you know, think of that. Think of TLS as just a new version of SSL. It's literally the newer version of SSL. That you, when you go to a HTTPS website, that's SSL. Again, we think of it as SSL, but it's all nowadays TLS. Um, well, all of your voice over IP stuff, certainly related to SIP, certainly related to now some of the gateway links are using that. Now you have to manage security certificates. Um, the good news is your security department does that every single day of their life. Um, while it may be very new for telephony people, um, it is not new for the rest of your your, your company. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, another really cool thing I think is this end user encryption indicator. I, I, it probably has more of a cool factor than anything else, but you get this visual indicator on your phone. Um, even if you're dealing with uh, a VI or a conferencing, you can see um, who's who's connected securely? Is this a secure call? You know, encrypted end to end. 
Um, and so you just get that visual comfort zone thing that says, yeah, hey, this we've got an encrypted call going on. Now, maybe you don't care. We have a lot of customers that really don't see media encryption being a big deal. Um, I would encourage you to rethink that um, and, and really start looking at it in different ways. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the um, application side of this and, um, and, and, and talk about those things. But I've got a number of, of significant changes. What I want to start with is talking about what isn't changing. Uh, those of you that have already migrated to release six, um, you know that the user license model had changed. Um, in the beginning of release six, they kind of did the version one, which was um, you had what the foundation, the mobility, and the collaboration user. Well, all of a sudden they realized, okay, this is not really how people buy stuff, um, and so they switched to a version two, which is the core suite and the power suite. Um, and and the good news is in release seven, nothing changed. It's exactly the same as what it was before. Um, and so you get uh, that same kind of, of coolness that, um, that that we had. So again, if you're not, boy, if you haven't even migrated to six and, and this, this core versus power, you really got to take a look at this because basically they've dumped everything into the user license. Um, even the core suite, you get significant value for that, you know, from voicemail. The basic voicemail is, in, is included in there. Um, now, you might have features that, you know, beyond quote-unquote voicemail that you want to leverage, and, okay, maybe that becomes more the mainstream side of this. Um, but, you know, one of the big ones, I live and breathe. If you're, if you're any kind of customer on this planet, I have a hard time thinking you don't think mobility is 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 critically important. Um, everybody has a smartphone in their pocket. Um, and so that alone justifies the idea of mobility. Well, why wouldn't we want to enterprise enable that mobility? Um, and we do things with all of the mobile apps are now included as part of the core license, so you don't pay extra for that. Um, I don't need extra licensing for the session border controller to drive that remote access, you know, what we call the, the mobile worker, if you will. Um, and so it's all in there. Even the core suite I find to be extremely powerful. Um, and the power suite adds some uh, pretty significant enhancements like Aura conferencing and then kind of uh, kind of ups the ante on, on what your abilities are with Aura messaging and even the multimedia messaging. So again, I'm, I'm again, not talking about this a lot other than to say you really got to love it and nothing changed. You, you still fully get to love it in, in uh, release seven. So all kind of good stuff. Now, one of the big changes that happened is, um, you know, it started in release six. You know, when release six, Avaya said, okay, the um, virtualization hypervisors that exist on the marketplace are now caught up to be able to support real-time communication-based applications. Um, you know, and, and like for VMware, that is the, the ESXi. Um, you know, when that came out, it was a much um, skinnier, more efficient hypervisor and really made it so that real-time communications works effectively. So that started in, in release six. And that the, anybody who has release six, you're very familiar with the term system platform. And all that was was a, a front-ended version of a Zen, X-E-N. Um, it's kind of an open-sourced hypervisor, pretty cool. And for Avaya, that proved out that it works, that you can virtualize this stuff. Well, fast forward um, in the middle of release six, 6.2, I want to say, um, Avaya started supporting literally VMware, um, you know, starting with release 5. Uh, VMware 5.0. And um, so a couple different ways to deploy that. But again, the focus here is really more on the appliance strategy and how we can make that work. Well, in release seven, Avaya is like, okay, we're supporting VMware over here. You know, if, if a customer has their own VMware environment, yet we're going back to Zen for our appliance-based version of that. Why don't we just adopt VMware? And so that's exactly what happens in, uh, in release seven. Um, the system platform goes away. So it does not exist in release seven. Um, the functionality, the concept of it still exists, except now it is called AVP, Appliance Virtualization Platform. Don't ever call it a VIA virtualization platform because that's not what it's called. It's Appliance Virtualization Platform. Um, and now that is a GUI front-end version of VMware. So it basically makes it life easier for Avaya and, and only having to develop to support one set of virtual drivers and those kind of things. Uh, but it's absolutely the way the vast majority of customers are doing this um, you know, in support of VMware. We'll talk uh, more about that concept. 
Um, in fact, I've already kind of hit a number of these uh, items already. But um, so everything is shifting in, in this world to VMware, uh, both whether it's your own customer provided hardware or if it's, um, it's something else. You know, again, this appliance play where you're buying Avaya servers still. Um, and instead of system platform, you're putting on AVP, and then instead of templates, like in the olden days, right, you'd apply an application template um, that had a series of pre-tested OVAs, uh, and, and, and now it's saying, well, no, you can mix and match. And that's probably the biggest benefit of release 7 and supporting VMware is the openness of even at the appliance level. You buy a, an HP DL360, um, and you install AVP, and now instead of having to pick predefined, tested uh, uh, templates, I can pick and choose what I want, which I think is pretty awesome. What that really gives us some flexibility is how you want to combine applications on hardware. So maybe in a data center where you've got a big, you know, you're talking big scale, you're talking, you're maxing out your communication manager, you're maxing out your session manager and your system manager, even your AES server, you may very well want to put individual applications on a single server, kind of make it somewhat dedicated um, just because of the performance and the capacities. Yet maybe for a smaller office, you're, you're, you're small, you're small users. So it's maybe a small communication manager, maybe an LSP, maybe you've got a branch session manager, um, you know, but pretty small stuff and you say, well, I could probably squeeze a whole lot more applications onto a single piece of hardware. And unlike the old days where, well, you had to pick and choose exactly how Davaya wanted you to do it, now you get it, it's up to you. You can mix and match these, again, provided that you don't exceed the capacities of, of the hardware. And that's actually one of the other cool things that Avaya added here was um, a thing called the SDM or uh, Solution Deployment Manager that helps you with that process to say, oh, you want to add a communication manager? Well, how big do you want it to be? Do you want it super big or little big? And you, well, based on that, um, you need these many resources. And when we deploy this, this OVA for you, um, we'll make sure to reserve the appropriate amount of memory and processors and storage and all that kind of good stuff. So in the end, you have multiple ways to, to deploy your applications. Um, you know, you, you, you pick your applications first and then you say, well, uh, how do I want to offer them up? And so we've got options. You know, in this first column, um, you're talking the virtual appliance, that AVP, um, and so it's kind of that appliance virtualization platform. Um, you, the licenses are kind of baked in, so you don't have to buy additional VMware licenses. They're they're part of the AVP. Um, you manage it through uh, Solution Deployment Manager, uh, which is a component within System Manager, and you really don't have to know anything about VMware because Avaya front ends that for you. Well, and again, what started in release 6.2 and absolutely carries forward in release 7, you say, well, you know, I already am a pretty cool VMware company. Um, I've got a lot of experts. I have a lot of spare capacity. Couldn't I just take your Avaya applications and put it in my virtualized environment? And the answer is absolutely. And that doesn't go away with release 7. So it's your VMware. It's your licenses. And it, you can use vCenter, and you could, if you wanted, still use the Solution Deployment Manager from Avaya. So it gives you um, a little bit more flexibility. Um, but understand, it's your VMware. So you have to understand how to do VMware. If you suck at VMware, this is not something you should think about doing, right? Um, unless you're going to get some managed services from somebody as cool as AeroSI. Now, um, Avaya has come out with this thing called a, a CPOD or a collaboration pod that says, hey, how about we bundle some things together for you and we will we'll, we'll get the licenses, we'll bake in it into our offers, we'll have this thing called a pod orchestration suite. Um, we'll do some miscellaneous stuff there and, and you know, you, it's probably a good idea to know VMware, but uh, the reality is we're going to front end it with system uh, manager and, uh, and, and some of the uh, SDM solutions. So you may not have to do that. Well, you should, and that's a great solution if you're looking for the, the box that has the Avaya sticker and kind of, you know, all in one from, from the manufacturer. But you should absolutely know that Aero SI, being a part of Aero Electronics, um, believe it or not, we are the largest, 
the number one, not one of the largest, I'm saying the number one largest v uh, VMware distributor globally. So I can almost guarantee, statistically speaking, whoever your IT guys are buying VMware from, chances are that reseller is buying it from us. Um, and so needless to say, regardless, I'm, I'm not saying you have to start buying your VMware from us, but we offer a lot of the technical support and maintenance and managed services that are associated with um, those resellers. So they come to us when things get hard. Well, it'd be crazy for us not to think about, hey, maybe we should put together a, a pod of sorts um, and let you choose how you might want to, um, you know, have, you love the idea of a virtualization of VMware, but you'd really like to put it over in the corner separate from the rest of your VMware environment. Because maybe your VMware guys still like to just randomly reboot servers because it's convenient for them. We know in the telephony world that is not a good idea ever. Um, and so we have to make sure that we change that concept. And so um, vPods allow you kind of the best of both worlds. I can still do vCenter. I can still do um, SDM. Um, we can provide the, the hypervisor and the licenses. We can provide managed services if it's still something that you don't want to um, get your hands dirty with. All of that so it works out great. So all of those things are cool and valid options as we go forward. Now you should know that when we talk about release seven, because we are not using system platform, there are some versions of redundancy and high availability that go away because those things were actually baked into system platform. Um, so as an example, with system manager, um, we had one of the, op we had two options that I could give you for redundancy on a system manager back in release six, um, either HA, um, which was actually a, a system platform concept, or system manager geo redundancy, where I literally just separate them and put them in two different places and, and, and handle it that way. In release seven, because I'm not doing system platform, there is no such thing as system manager HA anymore. Um, so you still can absolutely do system manager geo redundancy. So I, I, we're not gonna go through a, these in nitty gritty detail, but it's absolutely something to talk to your salesperson and your sales engineer about how you might be handling your redundancy today and does that change going forward in release seven. Personally, I think it's kind of cool um, in some of these options, and I don't even list it on here, CMS is a good example where um, one of the versions of, of CMS redundancy that I can have is leveraging VMware's HA. So I already have the capability of having an active and a standby in VMware. VMware is monitoring the active server, and if that ever goes down, can automatically fire up a standby server somewhere else um, and keeping those, those up to date. And it has nothing to do with CMS. CMS isn't doing any work in this whatsoever. It's oblivious to what's going on. It's the investment that you've made in VMware um, that is actually accomplishing that. So I, I lose some forms of redundancy and I gain others. Um, and in almost all of these, I think we're in good shape. Um, I don't think we lose redundancy as a whole, but um, like I said, you just gotta think of it slightly differently. A big topic for some, uh, might be this idea of the mid-size enterprise. I am a huge fan of mid-size enterprise for very specific environments. Love them for training, love them for labs. Um, you know, the mid-size enterprise was just a, a template back in release six that had a whole ton of stuff in it, like communication manager, session manager, uh, system manager, AES. Uh, there was a flavor back in the old days that had an SBC built into it, a lot of different things in there. Um, and in release seven, you kind of say, well, the concept goes away uh, because I can already mix and match just because seven allows me to mix and match. Um, and so I, you know, I kind of view it as, well, mid-size enterprise as, a, as an offer dies. I don't need it anymore because I get the exact same capabilities. And better than that, I have much more flexibility to scale so if all of a sudden you start small and put throwing everything into a single server and then say, you know, I'd really like to maybe vMotion this running OVA to a standalone server so I can get more performance because of the capacity of the new server, I can do that. These are all things that VMware gives us that I just never had access to either at an application level or at a system platform level. So it's, um, some pretty amazing capabilities come with um, just VMware in general. I can almost, almost, almost blanketly say 
if you're not doing your Avaya in VMware, you're kind of missing the boat because um, there's some really, really cool ways that I can um, make the system more uh, cost effective and give you a lot more capabilities with it. So if you haven't been thinking about VMware, I strongly consider, you know, recommend that you consider it. And how you pick your VMware is obviously you've got choices. I can still do AVP, I can still do virtualized environment, I can still do Arrows, uh, VPod, a lot of cool things that I can do with that. Um, I was going to maybe, Kelly, take uh, a quick check to see if we have any questions. Might be a, an interesting stopping point. Uh, I'm... Hi, Dave. Yes, we, uh, we actually do have quite a few, um, and I'm sure you probably answered quite a few of these, but I will read them anyway, just in okay. case. Um, the first one is, are our current gateway links in Aura 6.3 between core applications and gateways not TLS secured already? Uh, they're they're typically not TLS. They're actually using AES um, if you're encrypting the link. Um, some people choose not to encrypt that, um, you know, the H.248 signaling link. Uh, but prior to release seven, um, but they were all AES uh, encrypted if they were going to be. Okay, perfect. Um, we do another one. Um, is the 28 SMs in a single domain up from 10? Uh, actually, it was up from a much bigger number than 10. Um, I forget exactly what the release 6 version was. I think that was more than 10. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a definitely a bigger number than what it was in, in the previous releases, for sure. So I, I think it depends on what version you were coming from. I know in the very beginning, like, like in release 5 days, I think um, it was a very small number, but it's grown considerably over the releases. Okay. Um, we do have a few more. Um, the next one is, can you give an opinion on Avaya's strategy of running a modified version of VMware uh, AVP? Um, you know, it really, I think the, overall the version is good, right? And, and the fact that it is already, it's now isolated from everything else. The biggest issue I run into with, with using um, standard VMware as part of the rest of your VMware environment um, my opinion is I find that telecom likes to keep their stuff separate and so they, they love the idea of VMware but they really don't want their existing VMware guys doing anything with it because existing VMware guys love to say well oh, I know you say you need 12 V cores but I don't think you really need it I'm gonna only give you six no, 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 it doesn't get to work like that we Avias said they need 12 you give them 12 um, and so, it, you know, if you wanted a, a supported application, so I, I think I'm okay with the modified version, and it's I don't think it's horribly modified. It's still 5.5, I think, behind the scenes of, of SDM. Um, I think the bigger question is, are you looking? F do you do you want the idea of the one throat to choke? Do you want to be able to go back to a and say it's your stuff, you fix it? I don't want to deal with it. That might be a good reason to go with AVP. Um, but I think, you know, with, with managed services offers that we can complement that, and Aero certainly does this with a lot of our customers where, hey, call us, we will be the one throat to choke, we will engage of when we need to, we already have the VMware experts internally, um, and so it, it just kind of depends on a lot of, it's more political than technical. Technical, I'm good either way. I think all those options are, they work fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, we do have uh, one more. Um, any plans to support KVM? Uh, KVM, by KVM, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm assuming we're referring to like the monitor, keyboard, uh, and, and, uh, and mouse kind of stuff. I'm assuming that's what that is. And um, uh, I guess in the modern way, it's all IP based. So I, it's a good question, I think. Um, and I don't really have a, an answer as to whether it does or doesn't today. Um, so I, I, I don't have a good answer for that. I would I, I guess it depends on the platform itself. I don't think Avaya's play with it is anything different or unique. So I, I know we have, we've got a bunch of KVMs on our stuff today. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I don't have a fantastic answer for that. <laughs> I think we do have a few more questions, and I think we do need to keep um, yeah. keep going. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Um, 
if, if there are any questions that we do not get to throughout this, we will definitely answer them um, as a follow-up after the webinar, um, as we do have a lot of interest right now. So, um, Dave, we can continue and kind of have another breaking point for more questions. Sounds great. And and I saw one of the, the questions was, is this, you know, presentation going to be made available later? Absolutely. All right, we're recording it, and so we'll uh, we'll post it probably on, on. I think you guys post them on YouTube, right? On our uh, AeroSI channel. We will be sending out a copy of the recording and the slides um, this afternoon to everyone. So awesome. Please Cool, thank you. Uh, the next topic, I get we don't have to spend a lot of detail on this at all, but um, the idea of there is a new S8300. Um, the 8300D still exists and still mostly works. Um, there's a couple of caveats that we talk about when we, we do the Ds, uh, really related to whether or not you want to do embedded SAL or not. I sh um, based on some other information, I sh I, I'm really kind of encouraging people not to do the embedded SAL, to do a standalone SAL. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit later. But um, uh, bottom line is there is a new S8300E. VMware, uh, good or bad, is actually a thicker application than what uh, Zen was. Um, and so Avaya could do, uh, you know, squeak more uh, utilization out of the old 8300D is where um, the new one needs a little bit more. So uh, can still do it, but you notice, um, I think on my next slide, um, I've got some capacity differences. Um, and so if you're going to do an older uh, version of that, then you have to you have to pay attention to, you know, again, specifically Sal, I think, is where the, the big one comes in. Um, but even on the 8300E, we're talking about two different models of this. You know, if you're talking about kind of that embedded main where this is the PBX, quote unquote, um, you, you know, you have to pay attention to whether or not you're, you know, the limits of what can put in there. So usually we think of maybe a, a communication manager, maybe a communi possibly communication manager messaging, um, and then you know Sal, and just kind of depending on what you're doing with that. But the D version does not have the capacity to also support Sal. Um, the same way with the embedded, you know, which is really uh, for survivable rather, um, which is more like an LSP kind of a concept. Um, and you can certainly do that, but the uh, bottom line is the S8300 doesn't give you as much flexibility to mix and match servers um, like you, you would on the bigger side. So it's just something to pay attention to. Um, when we move into uh, the SDM or Solution Deployment Manager, this actually is in, uh, in some ways some new functionality. Um, in some ways, just a redeployment of some existing stuff. Like one of the favorite things I, I always loved, and anybody who knows me and, and has taken training from me, um, we've we talked about the Software Update Manager, or SOM. Um, and that was it was a great, cool application for anybody who's got firmware to upgrade and, and patches to deploy. You know, deploying the Software Update Manager helped facilitate that and automate it, literally to a point where one button says, go find my stuff. The second button says, go tell me what's out of date, and the third button says, go update it for me. Um, and so, a really great application, but it was a little kludgy on the server model that they used in the past, and so Avaya now moved that into System Manager. Um, so that's in there. So not only the, some of the other um, components, you know, the managing of, of these virtual uh, environments uh, and deploying them, but also kind of keeping things up to date and, and current. Because uh, I will admit, you know, when you have a, a ton of stuff, um, upgrading and applying patches um, can be a daunting task. And, um, you know, SDM certainly helps with that. One of the first things that I like about it is when you're actually deploying a new server or OVA, as we think of it, um, in the virtual world, um, you, Avaya always had a way and kind of a cheat sheet behind the scenes that would say, well, okay, when, it, when we first deployed this, we assumed max capacities and max resource consumption. Well, over time, if I was like, okay, granted, if you only have 2,000 users, no, we don't need 12 vCores for System Manager. Um, but um, you had to kind of program that manually within VMware. Um, well, now with SDM, as I'm pushing these and, and building these, um, it's interfacing with the various APIs uh, within VMware. So you pick a profile and you say, okay, I want to deploy a session manager and I only have 2,000 uh, devices. So it says, great, we are going to reserve three virtual uh, cores and three gig of memory and that will kind of give us what we need for that number. So it's, it's allowing you to kind of 
go based on whatever the variable is. Oftentimes it's devices, maybe users, um, and you can kind of say, well, okay, based on that, we've tested it, this is what you need. So it makes the deploying of, of these OVAs quite a bit easier. Now, in release seven, most of the things can be done with uh, with uh, deploying through uh, SDM. Not everything, though. Right? You find out quickly that as Avaya um, creates some of these new tools, um, that there's a lot of product teams and products in the portfolio that have to learn to adopt those resources. And so this is a, one of those scenarios where most of the core of Avaya or applications work well with uh, the solution deployment manager, and you see the list here. Um, but we find a quickly when we get into uh, some of the software update manager, which this is a screenshot of, that allows me to, again, tell me where all my stuff is. Do I have circuit packs in a G450 or even in a G650? Do I, I have an LSP that needs a patch? They'll all show up here, provided you've got your, your remote access set correctly, and that's usually SNMP and um, you know, uh, various admin users. That all has to be done for this to work, so I don't want to make it sound like it's magic. There's, there's work involved to get it so that it, um, uh, your devices and your applications will allow Software Update Manager to do that. But um, it'll go in and, and start helping you facilitate this, uh, performing upgrades, doing patches, um, updating firmware, that kind of stuff. Now that list is drastically smaller okay, in terms of what SDM can do today. Um, yes, you can do communication manager, session manager, branch session manager, utility server, and even some of the patching that might be related to AVP itself. Um, but we, there's a lot of other products that aren't on this list. So I don't want to make it sound like, oh good, with, with one cool application, I have the entire Avaya portfolio covered. No, you don't. Um, but it's a really good start, and as I think we'll see uh, versions coming out and releases, Avaya will get better and better at um, driving adoption within their own product teams. So um, we'll definitely see more of that over time. Now, one question I get, mainly because I'm the one driving the heck out of this, of um, for those of you not using System Manager to do a lot of your, your Avaya Aura administration, again, I think you're really missing out. Um, it has a lot of automation, a lot of very cool capabilities. I would encourage you, I, I think we have out on our YouTube channel, me presenting something called, is System Manager ready to replace ASA? Uh, I, I, go check that out. Go, go watch that video because I kind of go through some of the very common communication manager tasks that people do and how it's significantly better in System Manager than it is in ASA. Um, I, Dave Lover, am now to a point where I very rarely touch ASA or go into command line. I, I use System Manager for the vast majority of my stuff. Granted, I'm not a telecom administrator, a full-time telecom administrator, but um, I there are absolutely tasks that are easier. The question is, because I'd always say, get ready, ASA is gonna die, it's gonna go away, and the question is, well, is it? Really seven was the big question, is it gonna go away? And the answer is no. Avaya is still going to support Avaya site administration as of really seven, but I wanna make some, some caveats here. The first one is, system manager is officially a required component of seven. If I sell you a communication manager release seven, I have to make sure you have a system manager. Same way with you know, session manager and system manager, uh, the other items. Um, you gotta make sure that you've got a system manager in there. So um, that's one step you know, that if I needed to make, make sure it happens so that everybody has it, then they can work on killing off ASA. And I want you to note that I'm noticing more and more and more of the documentation is being rewritten, assuming you're using System Manager. So long gone are the days of, of you know, okay, if you want to make this change, go to command line and enter change sys ip dash o and edit your Ethernet options. Um, nope. Now they're saying, okay, go into System Manager, go to Elements, go to your Communication Manager, click on Parameters, System Parameters, Customer Options, and then hit View. Um, and so a lot of the documentation is being rewritten, which I think is a good thing, really encouraging that, that behavior. Um, but for now, at least, uh, ASA is not going away, so you can continue to do your system or your communication manager administration from, uh, from command line. So 
a lot of cool things. A lot of manual tasks. Avaya is working very hard to make um, this new loosely coupled services approach, this modular approach that is really powerful um, concept for deploying a, a modern communication solution. Pick the pieces you want, deploy those as separate services. The downside tends to be, well, there's a lot of points of administration now and making sure things work and Avaya is um, working very hard to, to make that easier. So you go to one place and then that one place is what uh, does the rest of the hard work. And already you've seen that with the user administration and, uh, and the like. Um, so very, very important and um, definitely kind of pay attention to. You should also know this may be a big deal, maybe not a big deal, but uh, presence is being moved to the engagement development platform. So it's, it's now a snap in. It's not a standalone server. This gives a bunch of advantages um, if you're in a, you're using the presence services, whether that's to federate to link um, or if you're using some of the uh, the mobile applications and even on the phone, you know the idea of a busy indicator, right? We all loved busy indicators. Busy indicators officially suck. I find that they they're useless um, because they don't effectively tell me what somebody is doing. It just tells me whether they're on the phone or not. Presence tells me a bigger picture. Um, and so on SIP phones, you're talking presence, you're not talking busy indicators. Um, and so you start adopting that concept of really seeing presence as a replacement for a busy indicator. Um, well, now there's, I need more of that, I need active active for high availability. You didn't get that before with APS. Um, now you do because you moved it into uh, engagement development platform and I can create some redundancy on there, a lot like I do with an experience portal. In fact, EDP looks a lot like an experience portal kind of behind the scenes, um, certainly some of the same concepts and, and uh, very powerful, very robust and huge scalability uh, when I move to that approach. So pay attention to it, it's good. Now, one of the big, 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 big things of Release 7, um, probably if I had to pick a single driver that would get people to want to go to 7, this is it. And it's the idea of this new thing called a media server. And I should caveat, it's actually not a new thing. Um, the Avaya or a media server has been around for a long time in the Nortel world. So whether you had Symposium or um, some of the conferencing solutions or the dialers, they used this thing called, I don't know, I forget what it was called back then, but um, it was what is now the media server. So we're actually on release 7.7 .7 of the media server and it has created some hooks that allow other products within the Avaya portfolio to leverage. So again, even though it is this Avaya or a media server is new to communication manager, it is not a new product by any means. It's been around for a long, long time. It's very um, tried and tested. It works great and uh, it's, it's really turning into a, a pretty powerful deal. But I, to explain why the media server is cool, I think of a gateway. And I think of all the reasons you buy a gateway, right? And so here's an example of, you know, modern G450. We sell a ton of these still. The only reason I would ever sell you a gateway is if you needed TDM endpoints, analog, digital, that kind of stuff. Um, or if you needed TDM trunks, like T1s. Maybe some survivability. Right, by adding in a, a, an 8300, you know, configuring it to be a local survivable processor, and now providing a redundant, uh, kind of a redundancy, or again, if redundancy is a bad word, survivability to um, those TDM things. It also, inside it, has DSP resources to convert you to the TDM that is on the gateway. So like if I had something else some, somewhere, like a, a, an IP phone, if an IP phone wanted to use a TDM trunk, I must have DSPs on that gateway to convert me from IP to TDM. Well, I also have DSPs used for media services, like codec transcodings, like I, I need to go from G.711 to G.729, or I need to go from encrypted to unencrypted, or maybe things like media anchoring, where I need to to have a place for a media stream to go so I can connect them together to talk to something else, like maybe a conference server, right? Those are things that I would have to, um, I'd have to sell you a gateway in order to do those things. No, we have to kind of talk through those. First thing I think of, clearly the world is going IP, right? We sell significantly less digital and analog phones than we did in the old days. And I'll be the first to admit certain industries like healthcare, they still need analog for patients' rooms. And until I can get it down to a $7 disposable SIP phone, which doesn't exist yet for the most part, um, 
you still might need those. So that may not be for you, but for those of you that are moving more to uh, SIP, as an example, or even H.323, but SIP becomes really cool, um, I don't need that. So all of a sudden I start pulling out cards. Same way with TDM trunks. Everyone knows the world is going SIP trunks. Um, carriers, almost every carrier that I've talked to intends to end of sale T1s as of 2020. Um, that is four years away, guys. Um, and so if your carrier hasn't told you about this, you should maybe proactively ask them because they absolutely intend to stop doing T1s. Um, and so now all of a sudden T1s go away because I'm doing SIP trunking. Um, maybe, you know, I'm a big believer that with all of this really cool uh, smartphones in everybody's pockets and using Avaya communicator apps or maybe even EC500, um, I've kind of coined the phrase, mobility is the new survivability. Why do I keep putting so much money into making a survivable network when every end user has a survivable network in their pocket? It's called an iPhone. It's called an Android. It's called a whatever. Um, now, again, I don't want to make it sound like this universally works in every customer environment or every, every industry or anything, but you have to believe me when I say a significant number of end users would rather use their phone uh, their cell phone um, as as their communication endpoint. They just need to enterprise enable that. Well, if all of a sudden we play it out all the way, and I'm not saying everybody can, but if you can play it out all the way, all of a sudden I don't really need survivability either because everybody has their phone they can pull out of their pocket and with the app um, it interoperate exactly like they were a desk phone over the internet back to maybe where an SBC is at the main location. All of a sudden that goes away. So now I'm left with this gate with this completely empty gateway that only has inside DSPs for TDM access and media resources. And oh, by the way, and by, by the way, they're the same DSPs. It's not like they're different. They're, it's a, just a pool of them. But in my scenario played out to the fullest extreme uh, scenario that I described, if I don't have TDM access, then I don't need DSPs to do the TDM access. So all I'm left with is needing DSPs for media services. And we have a lot of customers that are buying literally 10, 20, 30, 40 gateways, empty gateways, just for the DSP resources. Sometimes it's for call recording scenarios. Sometimes it's for um, IVR, conferencing, maybe. Um, so there's a lot of things that they need, the, the transcoding, the media anchoring, that kind of stuff. But they don't need the rest of that, the metal of that gateway. Um, and so wouldn't it be cool if I could just do something standalone with that? And the answer is heck yeah, it's called the Avaya Aura Media Services. It's version 7.7, .7, but is now adopted by Communication Manager. So literally, if you were to say, you know, a, a, a full-blown dedicated server uh, of Avaya Aura Media Server can handle up to 4,000 channels. To give you 4,000 channels with gateways, you'd need 13 G450s. That would give you 4,100 roughly channels and uh, take up about 39U of rack space. That's enormous to be able to drop that down to a single dedicated server. And oh, by the way, I can virtualize that uh, media server as well. I won't get 4,000 resources though, so pay attention to that. Um, the number drops, but I think there's a lot of people out there that don't actually need 4,000 media uh, resource channels. So it gives you some uh, pretty cool options uh, to do that as well. So um, where do you do this? Again, voice announcements are actually in here now. Um, you know, so even the announcement board resources that might be on a gateway or on a val board I could put on here. Um, maybe even reducing um, where we see the biggest bang for the buck is in contact center and specifically with call recording. Um, so huge, enormous cost savings that I can get because of these kinds of things. Now you do have to know though that I, it, this doesn't replace the need for DSPs in a gateway if you're doing TDM stuff. So if I still have a, uh, a, a G450 with a bunch of analog phones, I have to have DSPs integrated onto the, the motherboard of that thing because it needs to talk directly to the TDM bus of that gateway. Um, and so I don't want to make it sound like, oh, you can throw away all your DSP resources, all your med pros. Not a chance. It's a very specific scenario, but we're finding more and more and more as people go IP that I, I'm finding where I don't really need it to be on those boards. I can do it in this, in this kind of environment. So, you know, trying to do a little compare and contrast between media server and the G series, you know, is there a, a, a recording time limit on the media server? Nope. 
I have as much as you want. It just depends how much hard drive space you have in there, as opposed to the 45 minute or the 250 minute you get on the G450. Um, announcement capacity just depends on the number of channels you have. Whereas on a Val board, um, 31. End of story. Um, you're on a, on a G series gateway. Um, there are some things you can't do with the media server. For example, you can't do T.38 fax. So if you still have fax requirements that are going to be IP based, you're still going to need to use some of the DSPs on, on, a, on a G450 or G430. Um, codecs become a lot easier and better. Um, one misconception people think is MedPros do G.722. No, MedPros do not do G.722. In fact, you'll know that the only time G.722 gets activated is when you're shuffling directly between two endpoints that know how to do G.722. Whereas, and, and the big reason was it was tied to the TDM bus. Well, the TDM bus is meant to mimic the PSTN codecs or PCM, um, and that ends up looking like uh, um, uh, it's G.711 by default. So um, there's no need to have the MedPro do that. Well, now that we're not bound to the TDM bus, I can actually do media anchoring and transcoding with G.722. And while it's not currently supported for Communication Manager, the media server itself knows how to support Opus. And Opus is one of those cool new codecs that I talk about it all the time where um, we always think of, of voice quality in terms of toll quality voice, right, PSTN. I personally find the PSTN to kind of suck in terms of voice quality. All you have to do is listen to music on hold and you know how bad the codecs and the, the bandwidth that's utilized, it's, it's horrible. Um, whereas Opus is a newer codec that is not based on, on anything related to the public switch telephone network and is used in a lot of various multimedia uh, things. Um, Opus was actually be con being considered as one of the common standards for how do you encode your music. Like when you're, if you're going to rip a CD um, to put on your iPhone, you know, the, the standard is an MP3. Opus is a very real possibility because of the quality of that, that audio. Um, it's also um, currently slated to be the standard for WebRTC. So as we start get, you know, seeing WebRTC and, 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 and being a huge play for us in the communication space, you're going to need to be able to support Opus. Um, and again, it's not currently supported with Communication Manager, but it is in the media server. Um, and so a lot of different things. I find some a couple of characteristics of this really cool. Like I can actually have a single media server sharing one um, uh, or, 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 I'm sorry, having one uh, media server being accessed by multiple communication managers. And obviously, I can put multiple media servers on a single communication manager, um, but it gives me a, a lot of flexibility. So it's literally these various servers are accessing um, the, the media server for available resources. So for those of you with a huge environment um, where you have multiple communication managers, just because you need to go past the, whatever it is, 30,000 endpoints, um, now I, I don't have to have each communication manager with its own dedicated pool of DSPs. I can share them, I can pool them, I can do that kind of stuff. So it becomes a um, pretty powerful thing. And again, I can have up to 250 uh, or media servers uh, within a, a single Aura environment. So again, very, very cool. So where is it cool, where is it not cool? Um, again, the biggest, the biggest advantages are it's almost identical to the way you think of MedPros uh, today in terms of what they can do. And even the Val boards, you know, having the announcement capabilities. Anything that drives um, voice over IP channels, uh, I can do with a, a meet the media server. But you do have to know the, the downsides. And can't even say it's a downside. It's just, it's not applicable. Um, I need to, to talk to a TDM resource on a, on a gateway. I have to have DSPs that are physically attached. Um, and so you do that with, uh, with, with the DSPs that are on the gateway itself. So it, those don't go away. Um, one that I think, as I think through this, I think is more of a feature thing. If, if you're going to do T.38 fax, um, you know, that's, that's not a capability of the media server today. So maybe that comes in the future, but um, um, it can't do T.38 fax. It's, it's not applicable today. Um, and again, the big one that I, a couple people come out of this presentation saying, oh, I've got to get rid of all my gateways. No, not true. Not true at all. All this is is if it makes sense to go this route, go that route. 
Um, if you're looking to add more DSPs and you don't want to add more gateways, that's a great scenario. If you already have gateways, you already have MedPros, nothing is saying you have to get rid of them. You can absolutely keep them and keep doing it exactly the same way you are today. So this is not a forced migration by any stretch of the imagination. It's just saying you might want to think about it. It might be beneficial um, cost-wise or other, uh, but you can take a look at it and see what, uh, what the best approach would be. A couple of little nuggets. Again, I can do you know the standard codex, standard encryption. Um, it's commonly used for ad hoc maybe conferencing. You know, like communication manager is obviously going to be limited to six uh, speakers, but um, and aura conferencing, I can drastically expand that. Um, tone generation, the announcements and music on hold can all be stored on this this media server now, so that's pretty cool. Um, you do even though it's it's using SIP. Um, and the media services um, markup um, language, um, you know, so I, it's using SIP, but I don't need to put session manager in the middle. In fact, you don't put session manager in the middle. It's a direct uh, configuration link between communication manager and the media server. So if you're saying, hey, I don't have session manager, do I need to get one for this? No, you don't. Um, and so that's that's all good. Um, you don't, even though technically it is kind of a SIP trunk, it does not administer as a SIP trunk. So you don't need to build a SIP trunk or trunk groups or anything like that. Um, yes, you do need Communication Manager 7 for sure, because um, not only is it a new version of the media server, uh, it is also a new version of the software interface on, on the Communication Manager side. There had to be screens added to be able to support that, and that's in release 7. Okay, all cool. Now, in some of the last um, items here, and then we, we can just spend the rest of the time answering questions, um, there's a ton of little nuggets of cool enhancements that some of you, I know I, when I go through this, I'm like, ah, I don't care. That's not a big deal for me. And others say, oh my god, I've been waiting for that forever. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk through some of these that I think are kind of cool and uh, where you should pay attention to it. And absolutely, when you get a copy of this presentation or, or listen to the, uh, the replay, um, you know, dive into some of those and find out which ones might be cool for you. Um, and boy, there, I think there's even some on here that I didn't add. Um, in case that's true, let me mention it before. One big thing in release seven is now I can do service observing of a contact center agent, um, a SIP-based contact center agent and a SIP-based service observer. That was impossible to do in release six. Um, that, so that was added as a cool feature in release seven. So if you have a lot of, it's not so much the, the agent itself, of whether they're SIP, it's the service observer couldn't be SIP, uh, a SIP endpoint um, back in release six, but I can now. So um, I, I just remembered, I don't think I've got that as one of my items in here, so I wanted to throw that in there. But um, for those of you that are considering doing LDAP synchronization, very cool, but you just gotta know the downstream effects of that. Um, I can literally build a communication manager in Aura so that when, um, you don't do any moves ads changes anymore. When the when the uh, IT guy adds the user to Active Directory, maybe you have them put it in a, an AD group, like I have ours set up to be, I create an AD group called Avaya Users. Anybody that gets put into that AD group automatically gets synced over to System Manager, and I have a user provisioning rule created that automatically assigns them an available extension, and gives them a mailbox, and gives them a conference bridge, and gives them a presence profile, and I'm trying to think of another cool and, and I'm drawing a blank. Um, but I can do some of that stuff. Again, you just got to know the downstream effects. If you've got some crazy LDAP administrator who's like, oh, let's go change the base DN or change the LDAP schema, system manager will view that as, hey, look, everybody, everybody's gone. Let's delete everybody. And then, oh, look, they're back again under a new base DN. Here, let's rebuild them with new extensions. So if you're going to synchronize to a, an enterprise LDAP, um, understand that, that that has significant uh, meaning and requires some accountability on, on, on their end. Uh, but one of the new features that was added with release seven, because what I've described so far, could I could do that all in release six, but now I can, um, I, I can modify what roles get assigned to that administer that user um, as I sync them over. Um, so I think that's a pretty powerful thing, especially if you're using more granularity of your administrators. Um, some people just say, no, give every every one of my administrators has all full admin rights. And for a small company, that's pretty typical. For a big company, you're crazy. 
um, you need to start kind of separating people from what they can and can't do, and I can automate that task um, if you're going to start doing some of the LDAP synchronization. Um, some of there's changes within um, the you know the profile managers uh, that exist within System Manager and how I, I, I create users and how I build them that kind of stuff. Um, more of the reports that used to be in ASA and uh, the multi-site administrator are being moved into System Manager. Again, very much going down the path of they're they're moving everything out of out of ASA for the inevitable demise of ASA, which I think is a very cool and good thing. Um, some simple things that when you start doing more and more SIP, you find out you're doing E164 more and more. Um, and E164 typically requires a plus on the end of everything. Um, so in the call type analysis form that might be used for click to call and call log kind of stuff, um, we can um, have the plus digit in the um, call type analysis form. Maybe that's a big deal for you, maybe it's not. I think it's a big deal. It doesn't sound like a, a, a big deal, but trust me it is. Um, but it's all related to your adoption of E164 as your format, your number formatting. Um, some other cool things, um, probably on this list, I would say my favorite is the message compaction. Um, we run into issues where in this world of SIP, part of the beauty of SIP is anybody can add stuff to the SIP messages. At some point, the SIP messages become too big, and um, all of a sudden, some endpoints don't know what to do with a SIP message that big. They were never their, their firmware was never written to be able to handle a SIP packet that big. So in Session Manager, I can now create adaptations that remove um, certain things from the SIP message, making it smaller. Again, you got to be careful with that because if you needed the things that it was using, well, you just broke it. Um, but in the event that, yeah, boy, it's adding stuff just because it thinks it's cool, um, I could have Session Manager control removing some of those elements. Um, so there's some stuff there. What else? Uh, alarming on that on G series gateways, I can get alarming more granular alarming on DSPs. Uh, clearing of alarms. Um, the S new SNMP engine for Communication Manager. This was long overdue. Um, Avaya was using a, an old uh, SNMP management platform, um, you know, from the beginning of time. I mean, long time ago. So that got updated with uh, more of the new Net uh, SNMP. Uh, and a new set of sub-agents. So that's all been refreshed, um, making some of the serviceability better. Uh, Out-of-band management, we talked about the TLS gateways, uh, higher encryption levels, um, so to support for, you find over time, people are using more and more uh, security and, and stronger security. What was really strong 10 years ago is not strong today. Um, and so just because of processor speeds and hackers and they're getting more more competent and effective and the tools are smarter, um, you have to inc improve your security from what you thought was cool enough uh, even five, five, ten years ago. Uh, Avai is getting better at letting, um, well, they've always let you manage your own certificates, but helping you to facilitate some of that. Um, and we're going to see that as a big push. Uh, probably in the next, within the year. We've already started this where you really kind of get you need to start using your own security certs. Avaya has allowed you to be oblivious to that concept for too long. Um, and with some of the deprecation of the SHA-1 certs uh, that we've seen all over the place, you know, that uh, Chrome no longer allows you to go to a crappy website that isn't secure enough, you got it. Everybody's doing that. So even Avaya is doing the same thing and, and forcing you to uh, adopt a stronger security policies. Um, again, improved yeah, the certificate management for the gateways, the end-to-end -end media encryptor, I, I, uh, encryption indicator I already talked about are all cool things. Uh, some miscellaneous things like the triple tone for call pickup, I, that falls into the, I don't care, um, but somebody else may think it's awesome. Um, I don't use it, so I don't know why it would be awesome. Um, uh, certain things for uh, the adjuncts, you know, when you start talking about MDA, multi-device access, that was a feature that SIP gave us in early six to be able to have multiple devices assigned to a single user. Well, things get really hard when that happens. Like think of 911. I can't do it based on extension anymore because I literally have devices using that extension at, I have one at my house. 
I have a SIP phone at my house. I have my iPad in my uh, in my backpack. I've got my iPhone in my pocket. They're all the exact same extension, all registered at the exact same time. MDA presents challenges, um, and so really seven helps uh, with that for some of the various call uh, adjuncts and, and 911 providers out there to to help with. Okay, which one did this come from? Uh, again, more SIP capacity, AES, and DMCC uh, for within AES. So again, if you're pushing the limits on some of these other things, um, definitely an improvement on those. Uh, I think some of these, um, again, they get pretty granular, like with presence, federation capabilities, clustering of the, the, the present servers themselves, some of the control between presence domains, if, you know, if you're federating to somebody else, uh, like link, or if you have multiple uh, presence domains in your infrastructure, um, I did the control that I have between them. Um, I don't know that we have time for a quiz, um, so I'll I'll skip that at least for now. But um, so Kelly, I'm curious how what kinds of questions do we have? Do we have a ton? We do. We do have a lot of questions, um, and I and I think kind of to take a ton and take for our audience's time, we should probably um, kind of pull the answers together and send them out um, with a copy of the recording and the slides later today, so okay. that everyone's questions do get answered. Um, we want to make sure that we know they're very important. So, um, and we wouldn't have time to answer all the questions that we have right now. So, um, with that said, I'm going to kind of wrap things up. Um, we do have a survey.